Well, we have a nice missionary family with us today, Roberto and Patricia, and uh, did I say a hand? <laughs> I thought I saw it. <clears throat> and also they have their children, Isabella, Samuel, and Sophia. So it's nice having you folks here, and I believe they have a presentation for us now. Good to see that the presentation is ready to go. Good morning. It's a blessing to be back with you this morning. We were here five years ago. It seems hard to believe that time is flying. And I believe Patricia was able to speak to the ladies' meeting about March of 2015. Uh, maybe you don't know us, but let me take the time then to reintroduce ourselves. We are the Coelhos, and uh, we are your supported missionaries in the city of Sao Paulo, Brazil. Sao Paulo is a city of about 23 million people, and uh, they're all... Uh, Scared of this virus, though they're not stocking up on TP. <laughs> but uh, the Lord has uh, sent us there. Not yet. I don't know if there's a connection. I don't. I don't. I still don't have understood that connection. The church has partnered with us since 2004, I believe, so over 15 years, and uh, the Lord has allowed us to plant a church in the western section of the city of Sao Paulo, my wife Patricia, and uh, when the church took us on for support, it was thus just the two of us, but since then, the Lord has added three wonderful kids to our family, and uh, today happens to be Sophia's birthday. She's turning nine years old today, so if you'd uh, greet her after the service, I know she would really appreciate that, as it is her birthday. Samuel's birthday was on Wednesday, and he turned 11. So two birthdays uh, this past week. We praise the Lord for what he is doing in the city of Sao Paulo. Uh, we praise the Lord for the opportunity to serve him as we minister there. We've been back on furlough for two months, and uh, we're going to be gone on furlough this whole year, as uh, it is our desire to report to all of our supporting churches if we can. If they don't cancel services, we'll try to get to all of our supporting churches, and we'll probably end up visiting about 45 churches this year. But we want to thank you for uh, praying for us and partnering with us. And last year, you even sent some extra offerings towards our building fund. So we wanted to take the time to thank you for that and uh, to have you rejoice with us for what the Lord is doing. Think with me of a city named Bemidji, Minnesota. You know that city, right? In 1937, the Lord sent a couple from Bemidji, Minnesota to go to northern Brazil, to the Amazon region of Brazil, to share the good news of Jesus Christ. Among their very first converts was a couple named José and Maria, Joseph and Mary. And in 1941, they came to know the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Trimbles, Garnett and Fern Trimble, were the name of the missionary couple who left Bemidji, Minnesota to go to northern Brazil. And José and Maria Coelho were my grandparents. They were led to the Lord in the 40s by missionaries who left Minnesota to go to northern Brazil. My father was born in 1947 in Brazil. And at the age of six, he came to know the Lord through the ministry of the Trimbles in northern Brazil. In 1973, the Lord allowed my dad to come to the U.S. to attend seminary, and the Lord sent him to Minneapolis, where he attended Central Seminary. And someone told me this morning that uh, they were in seminary at the same time my parents were attending seminary. I was born in 1976, uh, January 5th, cold winter uh, morning. The car wouldn't start. Uh, as you can imagine, on January 5th, but I was born in 1976. And then my parents returned to Brazil as church planters and pastor and missionary. In 1991, our family went to the western section of the city of Sao Paulo as missionaries to start a church planting ministry. And my father chose this neighborhood. I was 14 years old at that time, uh, and we were serving as missionaries uh, sent from uh, Woodcrest Baptist Church here in the cities. And the Lord uh, directed my family to... Uh, Started church plant in the western section of the city of Sao Paulo, and my father found this building that used to be a family-run restaurant. And this Italian family lives upstairs, and they were renting the storefront, so we started holding services. And uh, two months into the Bible studies, the first person got saved in that ministry, the landlord's oldest daughter, Patricia. So she was uh, led to the Lord by my younger brother, who was 13. She was 14 years old at that time, and I was 15, I believe. And then as soon as uh, she got saved, I proposed to her, and then shortly thereafter, we got married. <laughs> Not quite. So uh, in 1998, I was 21, she was 20, 
Uh, we got married, and then two weeks later, uh, the Lord sent us back to the U.S. to study, back to Minnesota, and uh, we attended seminary from 1998 through 2002 here in the cities, and then after that, we candidated with Baptist World Mission, and uh, we raised our support and arrived in Brazil in 2005, and we've been serving the Lord in Brazil since that. So we praise the Lord for missionaries who've been in contact with our family, for missionaries who sent the gospel to northern Brazil to reach my grandparents. Uh, my parents have been missionaries. They're still serving in the city of Sao Paulo, and we've been serving in the city of Sao Paulo over the last 15 years, and we praise the Lord for the opportunity to serve the Lord in that city. This morning, we have a video presentation to share with you. First of all, we want you to rejoice with us as you watch this presentation on seeing God work in the city of Sao Paulo. Rejoice with us in seeing lives saved and transformed by the power of the gospel. And as you've been partnering with us, that is an extension of your ministry there. So we'll rejoice with us in seeing God do an amazing thing in the city of Sao Paulo. Rejoice with us as you see the beginning of the building of our building. Uh, you've contributed to that, towards that and you've prayed for towards that. So rejoice with us in seeing the beginnings of that. But please be reminded to pray for us uh, as we go back to Brazil. Uh, they are having services uh, this morning. They will continue to have that. But they are uh, prepping and preparing uh, for uh, the virus. I called our national co-worker yesterday and said, well, this is going to be difficult, but please tell people not to shake hands or hug each other. Brazilians like to hug. They like to touch. And I know that's going to be a struggle in church. But uh, pray for them, and uh, pray, pray for the completion of our building. We're not quite there yet, but the Lord is providing, and uh, we have been uh, busy with that. And uh, rem be reminded to pray for us as we are on furlough this year, as uh, we will be traveling. But as you watch the presentation, just uh, rejoice in seeing what God is doing uh, in the city of Sao Paulo. Rejoice that souls are being saved and transformed by the power of the gospel. And rejoice at seeing God at work in the city of Sao Paulo. And please be reminded to pray for us. There, uh, you're going to see a technical school that was built just across the street from our church building. They're hoping to have as many as 10,000 students going there. For the time being, they have about 2,000 students, and we're already seeing people saved from that. So just rejoice in seeing what God is doing in the western section of the great city of Sao Paulo. We are the Coelhos, missionaries to Sao Paulo, Brazil. Hello, I am Roberto, and this is my beautiful wife, Patricia. The Lord has given us three wonderful kids, Samuel, Sofia, and Isabella. Hi, everyone. I'm Samuel. Hello, my name is Sofia. Hi, my name is Isabella, and, and I'm the youngest. In 2006, we arrived in Brazil with a desire and a task. We were sent by Fourth Baptist Church in Plymouth, Minnesota, and sent under Baptist World Mission of Decatur, Alabama. Our task was to plant a church by making disciples of Jesus Christ. Our desire was to see people's lives changed by the power of the gospel. Over the years, we have seen God do an incredible work. We are glad to have been a part of that. God led us to plant a church in the western section of the great city of Sao Paulo. Sao Paulo is the third largest city in the world, with a population over 20 million people. That's over 20 million souls in need of the light of the gospel. As we came to the field, the Lord impressed upon our hearts the words of Acts 26, 18, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. We chose as our target a residential neighborhood in a suburb of Sao Paulo, about six miles from our home. This is a very Catholic neighborhood. Of course, many Catholics in Brazil are also practicing spiritists. We have also seen over the years an explosion of neo-Pentecostalism and the false hope of the prosperity gospel. Drinking and drug abuse are prevalent. We were faced with a spiritual darkness. It is in darkness that the light shines the brightest. As we have shared the good news of Jesus Christ in the neighborhood, we have seen many people bound by the power of Satan in need of the light of the gospel. 
But we praise the Lord that we have seen some come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, turn from darkness to light, from Satan unto God. We have witnessed many receiving the forgiveness of their sins through faith in Jesus Christ our Lord. We rejoice in the opportunity of seeing lives transformed by the good news that Jesus came to save those who are lost in sin and in darkness. When we started this ministry, we rented a storefront to hold our services. We had many activities with kids and adults with the goal of sharing the gospel with any who would hear. Every week, we went to the street market to make contacts and to try to share the gospel. The Lord really blessed those efforts, and a small group of believers began to grow. This gave us a great opportunity to try to teach them to obey whatsoever the Lord has commanded us. After renting for several years, we eventually moved into the local public school to have our services there as rent was becoming expensive. We began praying for the Lord to supply a permanent meeting place for the church. After about two years meeting in the public school, we were forced to move out and uh, once again rent. We praise the Lord for supplying each step of the way. We also rejoice that the Lord finally gave us a piece of property in the neighborhood. Land in a large city like Sao Paulo is very expensive, so it really was a work of God that we were able to acquire land. It really didn't look like much at first, and we had no idea what the Lord was going to do. Now that we finally had property in the neighborhood, we began praying for the Lord to supply for our building, and the Lord did just an amazing thing. A technical school began construction just across the street from us, and they offered to remove over 400 truckloads of rubble and soil from our property, all for free. Praise the Lord. After building several retaining walls, we were finally ready to begin the construction of the parsonage at the back of the property so we could stop paying rent and hold our services there. In March of 2017, we moved our services to the parsonage at the very back of our property, and for two years we met there. Though it was small and tight, we were really encouraged by not having to pay rent. Finally, in 2017, we were able to build the foundation of the building, then the walls. Then in 2019, we finished the first concrete slab. In April, we moved our services to our new and spacious building. Recently, we were able to build the walls for the second level. We still have to finish the second concrete slab, as we will have Sunday school classrooms and a fellowship hall on the second level. The first floor is yet unfinished, but we praise the Lord for what He has done so far. We have plenty of space now, and we have been receiving many visitors on a weekly basis, and the neighborhood finally believes we're there to stay since we have our own building. We even have had many visitors coming from the technical school just across the street. The building has been a great tool in reaching people with the good news of the gospel. As we talk about the building, we are reminded that our Lord is at work in our neighborhood. After all, He probably would build His church. We praise the Lord for saving souls in this needy neighborhood. We praise the Lord for the opportunity to make disciples of Jesus Christ in the city of Sao Paulo. We praise the Lord for the opportunity to baptize those who make profession of trusting in Christ for their salvation. Please rejoice with us in seeing many lives transformed by the power of the gospel. The Lord also directed our church to invite Pastor Douglas to work with us. He worked with us in 2019, and he's taking care of the ministry while we are gone. Our prayer is that the Lord may lead him to become the pastor of this church when the church is ready to become self-supported and self-governed and as the building is complete. Please pray for us as we continue sharing the love of Christ for the lost souls and as we desire to make more disciples of Jesus Christ. Pray for Igreja Batista da Fé, Faith Baptist Church. Pray for the completion of our building as well. Pray for the salvation of souls, so they may be turned from darkness to light, from the power of Satan unto God, receiving the forgiveness of their sins through faith in Christ. We count it a privilege to serve our Lord. Please pray for us as we continue serving Christ in Brazil. was a blessing, was it not? Amen. 
God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Perhaps we need to be reminded of these words as we see things changing around us and as we face situations around us that we cannot control. But as believers, we do not fear because we know the true God. He is with us. He is our refuge. He is our strength. So the psalmist says, be still. And know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. Come, behold the works of the Lord. What desolations he hath made in the earth. God knows what he's doing. He is a sovereign God. He controls things. He controls events. And he does all that he pleases for his glory. This morning, I want to invite you to open your Bibles with me to Acts chapter 16. In Acts chapter 16, we will again see that God is in control of the situation. He is God. He knows what He's doing. He is a sovereign God, and we can trust Him and praise Him and be still, even though things become difficult. In Acts chapter 16... We find Paul in his second missionary journey. He had just separated from Barnabas and is in his um, second missionary journey through Asia Minor, which is current day Turkey. Paul has taken with him four companion, three companions, Timothy from the town of Lystra, Silas from Jerusalem, and Luke, the author of the book, also joins him and he's originally from Troas. Four men who have been willing to serve God. But as we read the narrative, though these men are willing to serve God, they're not in control of the circumstances. God is in control of the circumstances. God is the one sending them. God is the one guiding them along. Because God is the one who's interested in seeing souls saved. God wants to see souls saved even nowadays. He sent His Son into the world to save people from their sin, whether in Minnesota or Brazil or Japan. God is still interested in seeing people saved. We praise the Lord for His work of saving us and then of saving others as well. As we endeavor to preach the gospel and share the good news with those who are lost, we can be very confident that God knows what He is doing. He is the one sending. He is the one sustaining. He is the one saving those who are lost. God works through his servants. He's the one who saves them. He's the one who calls them. He's the one who directs and guides every step of the way. He's the one who uses them for his glory. In Acts chapter 16, we will see God once again saving souls for his glory through the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ, using the servants that he sent there. Throughout the narrative, we will see God acting, directing, saving, and sometimes even leading his servants through many trials to accomplish his will in their lives and in the other lives around them. We're going to pick up the narrative in chapter 16 of Acts, verse 6. Luke tells us, now when they had gone throughout Phrygia and the region of Galatia and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. This is puzzling. Brother wants to go to Japan and Asia. They need to be saved in Asia. Tokyo is, I believe, the largest city in the world, is it not? And uh, Sao Paulo is the third largest city. Brazil has the second largest Japanese population in the world. My best friends growing up were all Japanese fellas. But God prevented Paul from going to Asia. Why? Verse 7, after they had come to Mysia, they essayed to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. Why? 
Why not? And they, passing by Mysia, came down to Troas. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. And after he, Paul, had seen the vision, immediately we, the group, endeavored to go into Macedonia. Why? Assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. Therefore, losing from Troas, we, Paul, Timothy, Silas, and Luke, we came with a straight course to Samothracia, and the next day to Neapolis, and from thence to Philippi, which is the chief city of that part of Macedonia, and a colony. And we were in that city of Biden certain days. God is sovereign. He is in control of all the situation. And in the narrative, we see that God wants to save souls in the city of Philippi. God wants to plant a church in the city of Philippi. So in order to have a church planted in Philippi, God sent four special men to preach the gospel there. The first truth this morning is that God sends. God sovereignly sends servants to fulfill his purpose of saving souls wherever he wants them to be. God sends. Paul wanted to take a right turn from Israel going to Asia. God did not want Paul to take a right turn. Actually, God wanted Paul to take a left turn and go to Macedonia. Paul thought that he would go to Asia and preach the gospel there. But God had other plans. So we see God preventing the team from going to Asia, stopping them from going to Bithynia. But more than that, we see God directing their paths and their steps. God gave Paul a vision, a man from Macedonia, saying, please come to Macedonia and help us. And as they thought about this vision, they came to a conclusion. And we see that at the end of verse 10. God has called us to preach the gospel in Macedonia. God had plans. And he's orchestrating events to send his servants where he wants them to fulfill his purpose. The Lord is still calling people to preach he places us in different locations according to his will, according to his plan. He places some of us way far in Asia. He places some of us way down in Brazil, in the third largest city in the world, where the weather is actually quite nice, mid-40s to mid-80s. Most of the time, it's around the 70s. And one of the ways in which I stay encouraged on the field is by checking the weather in Minnesota every day. Sometimes he puts people in very, very cold places where there's winter for six months or longer. But he always places us where he wants us to be because he has a plan for us no matter where he places us. God is definitely moving his servants to go to Philippi because God wants to send servants to Philippi because he wants to save people in Philippi. God is sovereign, and he knows. He wants to send us to preach the gospel wherever he places us. He intends to use us for his glory so that people can come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. I praise the Lord for taking a couple from Bemidji, Minnesota in 1937 and sending them by ship to northern Brazil, and then by boat to north Brazil in the Amazon region, actually north of the Amazon region of Brazil, to preach the good news of Jesus Christ to my grandparents who came to know the Lord in the 40s. My father came to know Jesus Christ at the age of six because God sent people from Bemidji, Minnesota, to northern Brazil in the 40s. God sends Notice that they were very submissive to the call. They went. 
Notice that they were submissive to God's sovereign will. As soon as they concluded that God wanted them to go to Philippi, what did they do? Immediately, verse 10, right away, they went. They were submissive to his call. They were submissive to his will. They were submissive to his plan. They gathered that the Lord was sending them to evangelize, to preach the gospel. Verse 13, on the Sabbath, we went out of the city by a riverside where prayer was one to be made, and we sat down and spake unto the women which resorted thither. And a certain woman, named, a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple, someone told me last week that they thought that Lydia was a Vikings fan because she sold purple. <laughs> Don't know about that. But there was a certain woman. She was from the city of Tythyra, and she worshipped God, and she heard us. She heard the preaching of the gospel. Notice, whose heart the Lord opened, that she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. These men are submissive to God's plan. They're submissive to his will. They're submissive to his call. They're preaching the gospel. But God is the one who saves. He's the one who opens the hearts. He's the one who opens their understanding. He's the one who shines the light of the gospel in the darkened hearts. Verse 15, and she was baptized. One of the greatest blessings of being a missionary is to baptize those who profess faith in Jesus Christ. I wish I could do it every Sunday, but we praise the Lord anytime we get a chance to do it. Last December, you probably saw it in our prayer letter. If you haven't, uh, they're posted there, and you see pictures of that. We are able to baptize uh, an old elderly lady. She is 70, I think, or 68 perhaps. We have preached the gospel to her for 68 years, uh, for 18 years, I'm sorry. For 18 years, she had heard the gospel. For 15 years, we had ministered to her, and she finally trusted the Lord last year. It was a blessing to hear her professing faith in Jesus Christ. I also baptized a younger man who came from the technical school. He had been just attending for six months. He came to visit one day and kept on coming, and then a young man started a Bible study with him, and he came to know the Lord Jesus Christ, and he was baptized. His parents were there. They heard a wonderful testimony of salvation. His family was there. Lydia was baptized because she believed. She got saved. She was baptized in her household, too. Her home was transformed by the good news of Jesus Christ. And she besought us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. And she constrained us. And it came to pass, verse 16, as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with the spirit of divination met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. Demon-possessed girl. The same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, listen to what she's saying as they're preaching the gospel. These men are the servants of the Most High God, which God would show unto us the way of salvation. Now what she's saying is very true. That's exactly what they're doing. That's exactly who they are. They are the servants of the Most High God, and they are showing unto the people the way of salvation. How many would like to have a demon-possessed person following you, shouting that as you go out and about? Paul didn't like it either. And did she did many days, and Paul was grieved. Day after day, as they preached the gospel, there's a demon-possessed girl following them, shouting, These men are the servants of the Most High God, and they want to show unto us the way of salvation. We have never seen a demon-possessed person in Brazil over the last 15 years. We praise the Lord for that. Though once, a young lady came to church after a Wednesday night service, and she said, I really need help. My brother is back at home. Uh, he's been speaking in a weird voice. He has both of his hands around his neck, and he's trying to take his own life. And my mother and, all, and I are trying to pry his hands off his neck, and we can't. She stayed behind with him. Can you please come over and help us? Because uh, he, he wants to take his own life. I was by myself. Wasn't sure about the situation. Wasn't sure what was really happening. Happening. So I said, 
do you think you'd bring him over here instead of me going over there? Do you think he'd be willing to come? She says, I will try. So about five minutes later, they both came over. I wasn't really sure what was happening. He did have a very, very strange look. So I said, is it okay if I pray? And he says, yeah. So we prayed. Then he called him down and said, is it okay if I read some scripture? He said, yeah. So we read John chapter 3 together. And I shared the gospel with the two. And he said, I have never heard this before. First time ever. I said, well, would you like to hear some more? He said, yeah, I might, I might want to do that. So for the next year and a half, we were able to have a Bible study with this family, mother, daughter, and son. And they all came to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. And a week ago, this young lady went to Bible school because she wants to prepare for the ministry. Praise the Lord for saving souls. But this girl in the narrative here is following Paul, demon-possessed girl, and did she did many days, verse 18, and Paul, being grieved, and turned and said to the Spirit, I commend thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her, and the Spirit came out the same hour. And when her master saw that she had been released by the power of darkness, turned from the power of Satan unto God, they rejoiced at the great salvation that God had done in her life. Not quite. When her master saw that the hope of their gains was gone, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace and to the rulers. And brought them to the magistrates, saying, These men, being Jews, do exceedingly trouble our city, and teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe, being Romans. And the multitude rose up together against them. And the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison charging the jailer to keep them safely. Who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in their stocks. Now, Paul and his companions were faithfully obeying the Lord. They were preaching the gospel. They were submissive to his call. They were submissive to his will. They were submissive to his plan. They were faithfully doing exactly what they were told to do. And yet... We find them in prison, having received many stripes, so many that their backs were bleeding. They were cast into the inner prison, a hole dug on the rocks, a dark, humid hole. No water, no light, nothing. And their feet were bound as well. They were chained. Why does God allow difficult situations in the life of believers. It almost seems that God is not paying attention. And perhaps when we face trials, that's exactly what we think, perhaps. God, do you not see that this is happening to me? Do you not care that this is happening to me? Why are you allowing this? Why are you doing this to me? Why, why, why? As we continue reading, there is a reason. Because there always is a reason. Because God knows what he is doing. God sovereignly orchestrates the events of our lives to fulfill his purpose in our lives. Why are Paul and Silas in prison. Why are they in Philippi? Why did they encounter this demon-possessed girl? Why did they receive a beating? Why? Because God knows. He knows what we don't know. He knows what was. He knows what is. He knows what will be. He even knows what could be or could have been. He knows all things. He knows what's best for us. And as we see in the narrative, he is sovereignly placing his servants 
where he wants them to be. Now, verse 25 is always a challenge to my life. After being arrested, after receiving many stripes, after being sent to prison, after being chained at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed. And sang praises unto God. How can they do that with bleeding backs at midnight in dark, in darkness? That's because they had learned to trust God and rejoice always. I don't know what hymn they were singing. But when I imagine the situation, a hole deep in the rock, darkness at midnight, in my mind, I imagine them singing, When peace like a river attendeth my way, When sorrows like sea billows roll, Whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, It is well, it is well with my soul. Though Satan should buffet, though trials should come, let this blessed assurance control. The Lord hath regarded my helpless estate and hath shed his own blood for my soul. My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, all oh, my soul, it is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. And sing praises unto God. And the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bands were loosed. And the keeper of the prison awaking out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself supposing that the prison had been fled. But Paul cried out with a loud voice saying, Do thyself no harm, we are all here. Then he, the jailer, called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they spake unto him the word of the Lord. And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord and to all that were in the house. And he took him the same hour of the night and washed the stripes and was baptized, he and all of his household, right away. Why were Paul and Silas in prison? Because God wanted to save a jailer. Not only the jailer, but God wanted to save all of his household, a family. God had loved the world and wanted to save this jailer. And what better way to reach a jailer than in jail where he works? 
But in order to do so, he had to send his servants to prison. And before that, they received many stripes. You see, God knows. He is God. He knows where he sends us. He knows why he allows the trials of our lives. He knows what he is doing. Our job is to trust him, praise him, and preach the gospel. God sovereignly orchestrates events to fulfill his purpose of saving souls. The jailer took him the same hour, verse 33. This is in the middle of the night. Wash their stripes. They had bleeding backs. And he was baptized. Verse 34. And when he had brought them unto his house, he set meat before them. It is biblical to serve your missionary's steak. <laughs> it says right there, he set meat before them. And rejoiced. Why? And the verse 34. Believing in God with all of his house. God sends. God knows. Third point this morning. God saves. God saves. He saved the Philippian jailer. He saved that family. He saved Lydia. He saved Lydia's family. He saved, perhaps, the demon-possessed girl living in darkness, bound by the power of Satan. She came to know Christ. God is interested in the salvation of souls. And even nowadays, God is saving souls. Because he is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The jailer asked the question, What must I do to be saved? What a blessing when people ask us this very question. Show me from the word of God how I can be saved. Sometimes it takes one sitting. More often than not, it takes many months, sometimes years in our ministry. Many. We've done it for eight years. This lady, 15 years. What must I do to be saved? Simple answer. Even children can understand. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. It's a glorious message. It's a message that can be shared with any and with all, whether in Japan or Brazil or in Minnesota. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. What a wonderful message we have that anyone who trusts in Jesus Christ as their Savior will be saved because God is not willing that any should perish because he did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him, say it, might be saved. God saves. He saved us. And he's still interested in saving souls even nowadays. Perhaps this scare is an opportunity for us to say, be still and know that there is a God. He saves. He loves you. Paul said in Romans chapter 1, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believeth. As we minister in a city of 23 million souls, we can tell each and every one of those, believe on the Lord, and you will be saved. As brother goes to Japan, with a population of around 50 million, is that right? 150 million. 
in that tiny island. He can say to each and every one of those, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. God is still interested in the salvation of souls. He sends, he knows, he saves. Verse 40, And when they went out of prison, they entered into the house of Lydia, and when they had seen the brethren, the group of believers who were gathered to worship God, the brethren, they comforted them and then departed. God had planted a church in the city of Philippi. Many years later, Paul wrote these believers a letter. We call it the letter to the Philippians. And he wrote them, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, for you all making request with joy. For your fellowship in the gospel, from that very first day by the river until now. And he writes, Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. He told them that they could continue trusting in God because God was still at work. God is still at work today. He's at work in Minnesota. He's at work in Brazil. He's at work in Israel. He is at work in Japan. What a privilege we have to serve a great God. He sends. He knows. He saves. We have heard the gospel news. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. Thank you so much for partnering with us. Please, please be reminded to pray for us. We have prayer cards out in the foyer. They're free this morning. (laughs) Stick it to your Bible, to your refrigerator. Be reminded to pray for us as we seek to go back to Brazil. And as things continue in Brazil, even while we're gone, we've got a national co-worker, Pastor Douglas, and he's uh, keeping things going. Continue praying for the salvation of souls. Pray for us as we travel from city to city, reporting on what great things the Lord has done in Sao Paulo. But rejoice with us this morning, because God is still saving souls through the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ, wherever he places his servants. Father, what a privilege it is to serve you. What a privilege to see from your word that you are a sovereign God. You control all things. There is no reason to fear. There is no reason to be concerned. You know what you are doing because you are an all-knowing God. You're an all-powerful God. You've promised to keep us, to protect us. Father, even as you send us through the valley of shadow of death, we may not need to fear because you are with us. Father, help us to have our confidence in you. Help us to be reminded that you know what you're doing even in all things. Father, perhaps this crisis is an opportunity for us to be reminded ourselves of who you are and to share with others Salvation through Christ. (coughs) I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. What a great day to have them with us today. Tonight, Brother Sawalowski and his wife, a mission that really to local churches to help train us to reach Jews for Christ. They'll be with us at 6 o'clock. You know, I was listening to our brother talking about uh, how God engineers things. Can you believe this? God has shut down all the churches except the Bible preaching churches because most of us are under 250 so we get to stay open and and God shut down all the sports activities so what are people going to do they'll have to come to church so this is our opportunity 
let people know we'll have church and who knows uh, maybe pretty quick then we'll be over 250 and we'll have, then we'll have to break the law and be thrown into prison so um, just think about this is a great opportunity isn't it mainly to be positive and not to be fearful but to say God is in control and uh, I have to admit I'm a little paranoid every time I cough I'm thinking oh somebody's going to think I've got uh, you know coronavirus or something but uh, I've had a cough for about 50 years so uh, that's nothing new and uh, anyway well brother Matt I know you love missions but you dismiss us in prayer let's let the Quayos go back to their table and be there and greet them shake well don't shake their hands smile at them and uh, isn't it great to support those missionaries in San Paulo Brazil and just a great thing. And all the missionaries we support, boy, we are a really blessed church. And communicate with them and hear from them. And uh, I know, Brother Darrell, you want to go down to San Paulo, don't you? So, and help them. Uh, we better pray for Brother Darrell now that he's a single man again. He might take off somewhere in the world. And so, uh, just pray that God will bless him and comfort him and help him as he journeys on, uh, walks the road, but not alone with the Lord and with us, right? And so Brother Matt dismisses in prayer. And then don't forget to sign up if you want a lily. And then don't forget to greet uh, the Southerns. Don't forget to come back tonight and invite somebody else to come with you. Brother Matt.